Bruce Jenner, thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for this working this out. This is a great place you live. Tell yeah. us about uh, Hidden Hills. Well, Hidden Hills is an area in Los Angeles, uh, just outside in the valley, kind of just as the valley ends. And it's a totally gated community. Um, it's just wonderful. Once you get inside the gates, it's like you're, uh, you know, you're out in the country. Everybody's got horses and acreage and, you know, riding trails all through it. And it's just, it's a real horse community. It's been here for a long time. Uh, but it's, it's, it's like you're a million miles away from Los Angeles, but you're not that far away. <laughs> you know, when a lot of us think of Bruce Jenner, we think of 1976. What did that year mean to you? <sighs> it meant a lot of things to me. When I went to the games, I was the favorite to win. I had the world record. Um, and so, and I planned on winning. So it didn't come as a shock to me to win because I'd only lost one meet in the last three years. But the nice part was, it was the last meet of my life. And I walked away, retired, I quit that day, so satisfied that my athletic career ended that way, on such a high note. It was just such a good feeling. Because when you go to the Olympics, you train for four years between 1972 Olympic Games and 1976 to be at your best on that day. And I was absolutely at my best on that day. I came up with the world record performance. I got all the marks in every one of the 10 events I wanted. And I walked away just feeling so satisfied and so happy that I was able to finish my career. The nice part was, is that it's amazing to go on and take the world on, one on one. You know, where you're just in, a, you know, I'll never be in a situation like that again, where you, you, you take the world on. And to walk away with a win, a victory, to have climbed every mountain that you can possibly climb in your sport, um, it was a, an extremely satisfying feeling. And what I learned from that is what tremendous potential lies down deep inside of every one of us. I never thought I could do something like that. I mean, that always happens to everybody else. But I learned a lot about climbing mountains, about being on a great journey in life, and it was uh, quite an experience to go through. What kind of a kid were you? Were you sitting around dreaming about the Olympics? Not even close. <laughs> I was sitting around, scared to death, to go to school. I grew up dyslexic, dyslexic kid. Um, I, my biggest fear in life, really downright fear, scared, sweaty palms, fear, was not going into the Olympic arena because in front of billions of people, because I knew what I was doing there. My biggest fears in life were as a young child having to go to school because I was afraid the teacher was gonna make me read in front of the class. Um, not only perceptually did I have a problem picking the words up off the piece of paper, but um, I was so afraid that I was gonna look bad in front of my friends, the process just didn't work. And so I was always afraid to go to school. Um, and I had suffered from tremendous low self-esteem because everybody else is smarter than me, everybody else is a better reader than me, and we put a lot of pressures on young people when they're going through school. Um, and for me, it wasn't until fifth grade where our gym class had uh, set up a bunch of chairs, you know, in gym class, and every kid in class and every kid in school had to go out and run around these chairs and get a time. And I went out there, like every other kid, and put my foot on the line and ran as hard as I could around these chairs and came back, and I wound up having the fastest time in the whole school. And all these kids are coming up and giving me a pat on the back and saying, gee, Bruce, I didn't know you were that fast. And frankly, I didn't either. <laughs> but uh, uh, all of a sudden, this thing called sports, uh, I said, what is this thing? And from that point on, sports became important to me just for my self-esteem. I mean, I could go on the football field with a kid who I knew was a good student, good reader, and you know, get in there and clean his clock. You know, I mean, boom. And that felt good. I liked that feeling. So I, I found my little, what I call my arena to play in. And uh, it, it, it helped me tremendously, my self-esteem. I felt better about myself. It helped the reading problem. It gave me more confidence in life. So uh, that was the big, really changing point for me. It was fifth grade. After that, I started to do better in school and, and get more interested in school. Hmm. In the 76 games, you did uh, a variety of events. Uh, you have to be skilled in a lot of different things for that, don't you? 
The decathlon is a, a 10 event competition in track and field. Um, you have to run the 100 meters, you long jump, throw the shot, high jump, 400 meters. It's the first day of competition. Second day, you run 110 meter high hurdles. You throw the discus, pole vault, javelin, and then run the 1500 meters. Um, it is an event that's been around since 1912, the first Olympics uh, that they had the decathlon, which Jim Thorpe from the United States won. Uh, and after he won, uh, the king said uh, to Jim Thorpe, you are truly the world's greatest athlete, because he had won this such a versatile event. And that title kind of stuck along with the event oh. ever since then. So it is a true test of a person's athletic ability, the ability to be able to run, jump, and throw. That's what you think an athlete should be able to do. Run four different ways, 100 meters to 1,500 meters to 110 meter high hurdles, 400 meters. Throw three different implements, a shot, a discus, a javelin, and jump three different ways, long jump, high jump, and with a pole in your hand. So it is a standardized test throughout history of a person's athletic ability. To me, that which was so intriguing when I first got started, because I thought I was a you know, pretty good little athlete. And uh, I said, this is the ultimate test. You know, this is the big test throughout time. I can compare my times against Jim Thorpe or Bob Mathias or any of the great decathletes in the past. So that's what really was intriguing to me about the event, the history, the Olympics, uh, and to test myself as an athlete. How have your Olympic records stood up over the years? Actually, quite well. I'm, you know, I scored 8,634 points, uh, which was a world record for five years. Uh, it was the American record for uh, 16 years mm -hmm. until Dan O'Brien finally came along, who won the last Olympic Games in the decathlon. It was the longest dry spell the Americans have ever had, 20 years of not winning the event. And it was great to see Dan win and the, the gold medal come back here to the United States. And so we, Dan holds the world record, so we now have the world record holder and, uh, and the Olympic champion back in the good old US of A, where it should be. And uh, we have a lot of pride in our decathletes. So, um, you know, my record held, held up very well. Uh, you know, even today, it, it would have taken the bronze medal in the last Olympic Games. It would have won the Olympic Games before that in 1992. So uh, it's, it's amazing to me uh, that I was a little bit ahead of my time, you know, at that time. What is it like the night before uh, an Olympic competition? It's horrible. <laughs> The Olympics is not a fun experience. You don't think, oh, I'm going to go to the Olympics and have a good time. Um, it is the biggest pressure cooker in the world. There's no question about it. The, the pressure that you deal with, it's a one-shot deal, you know. Um, you have to wait another four years. There's so much media. There's so much hype behind it. It means so much to you. You trained every day of your life for the last four years for that one competition. And uh, it's not a fun experience to go through. If you say it once, you say it a thousand times. Why am I doing myself? Why am I doing this to myself? You know, why am I doing this? And uh, but somehow, uh, with years and years of training and everything, somehow you get through it. The way I used to look at it is, and uh, I, I used to take all these emotions that we have, and in the, and in the Olympic arena, the emotions are at their peak. The emotions of pressure, enormous pressure, fear. You're scared to death. I mean, it's tough to go out there. It's, it's a scary deal. Doubt, can I do this again, on and on. We have so many great emotions. And for me, that was always a signal to turn my brain on, to use those emotions to propel me forward, not to slow me down. For instance, fear. I would never let fear get in front of me, you know, mentally. I would never let it get in front of me. I don't want to hit up against fear. I want to take fear, and in my head, I would turn it around and place it right behind me. I can mentally take fear and put it there. I want it to push me. I want it to make me run faster. Pressure to me was something that turned my brain on. When I feel the pressure coming down and the biggest pressure meets of my life, I always was able to perform better under pressure because I, I, it, it made me think. It made me the smartest athlete out there. There's the athletic body, which is the physical aspect of competition, but then there's also the athletic mind, which is the mental aspect of competition. And that mental aspect of competition is so extremely important. That's what the games are all about. Everybody in the Olympic arena ha physically has the ability to win. They're all that good. But it's the person who can come up with their performance and push themselves and bring that performance out on that day. That's the athletic mind. Mm. And so that's what the games are all about, is, is being the best you can possibly be on that day. What separates a guy who comes in first place from the rest of the pack? What's the difference? Inches. <laughs> Just a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> Um, I think, again, it's a head game. Um, I consider the competition 80% a mental challenge. Mental. 
20% physical. You know, they think the decathlon, 10 events, it's so physically tough. And, and, and it's physically tough to train and get ready for it. When you actually get there, it's not that terribly bad. But the real tough part is bringing, the, again, bringing that performance out on that day and uh, beating everybody mentally. I mean, the preparation that you have to do, putting yourself in position to win, mentally putting yourself there, and coming up with the performance. When you need the performance, you have the guy who's going to win is the guy who comes through. It's not the guy who doesn't. You know? oh. So uh, it's, it's a mental game. After the Olympics in 76, you were on top of the world. Your face was on cereal boxes uh, across America. Was it a tough transition from there to uh, back to real life? It's a very tough transition to make. The life of a world-class athlete, the life that I was living for those, uh, those really last six years of my career from 1970 through 1976, was not what I would consider a well-rounded lifestyle. Um, because uh, you exist on Earth only to score points. Your entire day surrounds training. Uh, become, you have to be very selfish with your time, with your energy. Uh, you don't have to grow up as a human being. You just have to score points. You don't have to mature. You don't have to worry about business. You just score points. Well, all of a sudden, within a 48-hour period in 1976, on the 29th and 30th of July, I retired that night. That, that was the last meet of my life. You were the best in the world at what you did, but that doesn't mean you certainly prepared yourself for other things. And all of a sudden, I happen to be the right guy in the right place at the right time. And all of a sudden, you're thrust out into the world in areas that you are not confident in. For instance, a couple of months after the games, I was doing a show for, in the United States called Good Morning America. And the guy says, OK, now turn around and read the teleprompter. Um, and all of a sudden, I was that dyslexic kid back in class who was afraid to read in front of the class. You still have all those demons in your life that you have to deal with. And so I thought, boy, I better learn this real fast. <laughs> and uh, it was a tough transition. You have to make business decisions. I never had to worry about business before. I think at the beginning I relied too much on other people to make decisions for me. It's the easy way out. But, um, and I surrounded myself with uh, some people that I don't think were, had my best interest at heart. They, had, they wanted the money, the position I was in, and all that sort of stuff. You get all these hangers on. And so it just takes a long time to mature, to grow up. And I would have to say through the middle 80s was probably my toughest time. Uh, I had uh, basically lost all the money. Everybody else had gotten it. It was all gone. I'm living by myself uh, in a small place. Uh, it, was, it was about five, six years in there where I just lost my drive. Uh, I, I, why work? Why do these things? So uh, it was really tough on me. It wasn't until almost about 1990 when you were approaching that big age, 40, all of a sudden I started thinking, wait a second, I was at my best when I was on a great journey, when I was going for the Olympic Games, when I had business things I was trying to, I was at my best. And I think everybody's at their best. When they wake up in the morning, they're excited about life because they've got something to do, whether it's improve the relationships with your, you know, your kids or your husband or wife or build a business or, uh, you know, be athletic or whatever it may be. You're at your best when you're going after something. So in 1990, I, said, uh, 1990, I, I said, I I really have to turn my life around. I, I've got to do something here. And uh, so I started getting back into business, started to get back into life. And then about six months later, I met my wife, Chris, which was uh, the greatest thing to ever happen to me. Uh, she's the love of my life, the, uh, my partner, my friend, my lover, my, you know, the wife to my kids. Um, uh, she's been wonderful and we need mentors in life. We need people to surround ourselves and she helped me believe in Bruce Jenner and make me at my best instead of she wasn't taking anything from me. She just wanted me to be at my best and I wanted her to be at her best and because she had gone through some tough times and so the two of us met and we've been able to build a wonderful life together and that's why today I can do the book. I couldn't have done this book you know six seven years ago. Back to the Olympics. Would you have competed in 1980 if the U.S. had participated in the Olympics? No. You decided was, to get out. I was done. It, it, you know, it was the right decision to make at the time. I believe in a, a quote from Roger Bannister, uh, the great four-minute mile, our first guy to break four minutes in the mile, the British runner. I saw a quote from him uh, before the Games in 1976, and actually I had it superimposed over a picture of me finishing the 1972 Olympic Games. And it really summed up what I thought about sports. And uh, what he said is, uh, uh, only in something like running, 
can finality be achieved. But it is not the type of finality that leaves you with nothing to live for, because sport is not the main aim in life. Yet to achieve perfection in one area, however small, makes it possible to face uncertainties in the more difficult problems in life. You know, that summed it up for me. Sports is a game. We can only play it at that level for a very short period in our life. We have to take what we learned in sports and in that competitive arena and take that same competitive spirit and, and, and direct it towards life, towards business, towards family and everything. Because life is not easy. We live in a very competitive world. You know, uh, we start competing as a young person to, uh, you know, as, uh, for our brothers and sisters for that toy. Uh, we're in high school and we're competing against the person sitting next to us to get a better grade so maybe we can get into that college. College is extremely competitive. Then you get into business. <laughs> There's nothing more competitive. The Olympic arena is easy. You know who your competition is. The business arena is extremely tough and you have to be competitive there. And it's that same competitive mind that an athlete has that a business person has or somebody else has when you're trying to build something, and, you know, trying to make something of your life or some business. Your book, uh, Finding the Champion Within, is much more than just a sports book. It's really about playing the game of life. Why did you write it, and uh, what were you trying to tell the audience? Well, I decided to write it for, well, the main reason is, is what I learned from my Olympic experience and over the 20 years since then is we have tremendous potential as human beings to overcome obstacles, to take our life to kind of that next level. We all have the ability. I call it that champion that's down deep inside. I've learned it in my life. That experience in 1976, which people remember you for, but since then, uh, people were inspired by that story. You know, what happened in the games. I get letters still today, 20 years later, people tell me what an impact that had on me. And so I wanted to take the book and I was in the right place in my life. I kind of had my life together for the first time. And uh, I said, I want that kind of that story to live on to help motivate others, other people. But more importantly, I want people to believe in themselves. Too many people do not. You know, they go through life and they just live from one day to the next. You know, they never get anywhere from in life because they're just kind of just living life. Just, just, you know, getting through the daily routine every day. But life is always at its best when you are climbing a mountain, when you're trying to do something, when you're trying to overcome obstacles, take your life to that next level. And so the book is really for me to help people believe in themselves like I had to believe in myself for so many years. Um, and to give them the tools, the keys, that they need to take their life to the next level. I, I would like them to read the book and uh, uh, be inspired by the stories that are in it and the lessons that have to be learned, but also do some sort of searching in themselves, or sitting down and saying, okay, this is where I'm at in my life, read this and say, okay, how can I go to the next level? Because the story is, uh, in the stories that I have and the steps that I did is, what I did is I took the decathlon, the event that I ran, and used it kind of as a metaphor for life. Because we do have so many events that we run in our lives. We're high, in, we, you know, we're dealing with kids. We're dealing with, you know, uh, your husband or wife. You have parents that you have to deal with still. And then you get out into the business world and you run all the different lives that you have to, all the different events that you have to run in business. And on and on. And I took that as this little metaphor. And I said, uh, okay, how can I take the 10 events and break it into 10 steps? And I was able to do it and play with each one of the events. For instance, the 100 meters, the first event in the decathlon. Uh, to me, that signifies starting. It's the first event. You gotta come out of the blocks in the 100 meters quickly. So how do you get started? What have you been putting off for so many years? Well, let's get started. You know, what do you have to do to get started? Talk about people who, because they started something, look what it grew into, you know? Um, and then, you know, another event, the shot put, you know, the third event in the decathlon. Uh, to me, that signifies strength, because you have to be strong to throw the shot put far. Well, what are your strengths in life? Too many people do not accomplish things in life, because they, they're too worried about their weaknesses. They say, oh, I can't do this because of this reason and that reason. and every, There's a million reasons why not to go after something in life. Okay, And it's very easy to be complacent and let them take over. But let's start with your strengths. What are you good at? You know, um, um, Another event, the pole vault. Eventually you're going to reach a height, you're going to keep jumping higher and higher until eventually you reach a height that you fail at, you don't make. Mm. What about failure? How do we deal with failure? And so I go through all the 10 events in the decathlon and give 10 steps uh, to really soul searching and, and hopefully you can find where you're at in your life and where you want to go. You have a great story in the book about Colonel Sanders uh, and how he started Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, talk about that. 
Here's a great story of a person who got started with something. He, he had basically, only thing he had in his life was a recipe. You know, people say, oh, I don't have this and that, I can't do it because of this. All he had was a recipe. It was a good recipe, you know. But I got to start somewhere, so let's start with this recipe. But he went out and tried to sell his recipe. And he went to hundreds of restaurants and nobody would say, you know, no, we don't need you. I'll sell you this re recipe and then you can do this. And I don't know. It just didn't work out. But then he goes to the hundred and first, first place and all of a sudden he gets a bite. And all of a sudden things start working. And once it started, it started growing and growing and growing. You know, and it's every, every person out there has a starting point. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger I talk about. Great movie star. But I knew Arnold back when he, 1975, when he was in the gym. I met him in the gym when... I'm looking at this guy, and he's so built up, and so big, and so massive, and all he does is flex, you know. I'm, I'm like in the real sport athletics and everything, you know. And, uh, and he couldn't hardly speak English, you know, he had such an accent. And I'm looking at him in the gym in 1975 and thinking, what is this guy going to do with his life? You know, where is he going to go with his life? And uh, we've been friends ever since, but look what he has done. You know, he took what he had, what he was good at, and that was being big and have a presence. And he took that and he built a movie career out of it, you know, um, just because he started something, just because he wanted to do that. So I try to talk a lot about that, about people who uh, um, overcome tremendous obstacles, but didn't have much, but built something out of it. Bruce, thanks for joining us today. Hey, it was my pleasure. Thank you.